Welcome to another episode of Conversations with Leslie. And today we're here with my dad, Henry Vaughn. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I am very glad to be here. Thank you for joining me. So, you know, I've always respected you and your experiences in life. And I just wanted you to share your perspective about, you know, the things that are going on in the news, in our society, and the engagement globally, right? So, first of all, why don't you tell everybody a little bit about yourself, where are you from, how you grew up, and how did you get to this area? Well, my name is Henry J. Vaughn, and uh, I grew up pretty much on the East Coast. Uh, my father was a military man, uh, Marine Corps, so we traveled a lot. Every two years, we would get transferred to a different military base up and down the East Coast, you know, Philadelphia, Maryland, North Carolina, and South Carolina, but we spent a lot of time in South Carolina, Paris Island. My father, LaSalle Vaughn, was a man of mans. He's definitely my hero. Okay. He is, the, he is definitely the definition of a man. Okay. So, growing up predominantly in the South, um, I went to Robert Smalls High School, you know, graduated in 1968. And after graduation, uh, my friends and I, we went to New York, mm -hmm. hung out for a couple of years until we all got drafted. You knew it was coming. You knew it was coming. It was during the Vietnam era. Mm -hmm. So it was five of us, five or six of us, my closest friends. Um, we all went down to Whitehall in New York, uh, military induction at mm -hmm. the same time because we got draft notices. I actually... Um, ignored my first three draft <laughs> until they came knocking on my door and told me if I didn't respond to the next one that I would be arrested. So um, I actually joined the Air Force uh, in 1968, uh, spent four years, did about two years in Southeast Asia, and uh, it was a great experience, both good and bad, but if I had to do it again, I would. Wow. It, a, it helped me grow up. As far as the serving in Vietnam or visiting Southeast Asia? Well, actually serving. You know, I got an opportunity to serve my country. And um, also um, in Southeast Asia, you know, Philippines, Vietnam, um, those places, it helped me grow up. It gave me a different perspective about the world. Mm -hmm. it, uh, it's uh, what you call a, a, a realistic eye-opening to the world. Mm. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, I definitely think international travel is important for mm -hmm. personal development, for people to be able to see things from different points of view. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I think that uh, one of the um, foundations for education, I think, is traveling because mm -hmm. it gives you an idea of how um, other people live in the world. But out of all the places that I've been in the world, and I've been to quite a few, with all our problems that we have in this country, it's still the best place in the world to live, you know? So, um, travel okay. is definitely a great education. Okay. So after, um, after being discharged from the military mm -hmm. uh, in 1972, my younger brother and I, Anthony, we went on a, a party junket. So we <laughs> drove all around the country going to parties. Oh, Miami, really? Like a road trip of parties? Road trip of parties. And uh, so we took a road trip here to D.C. and uh, ah. came up for a party and uh, never left. And never left. Never so that's left. how you got here. Exactly. Came oh, here for a party. turning never up. Left. Yep. <laughs> never left after that. Okay. So we've been here ever since. Okay. 1973, I think it was. To Washington, D.C., and then into the suburbs of Maryland. Yes. Okay. So speaking of international travel, different perspectives, you know, there was a, I don't know, a reinvigorated social action push throughout the country that we've seen, especially spawned by the death of George Floyd. And you also noticed that internationally, there were a lot of people that were speaking up and, you know, addressing the fact that, you know, black Americans are not treated equally and are just not treated properly, really anywhere in the world, but definitely in America. 
And, you know, you came up during civil rights. You said 68. You were in South Carolina. You graduated in 68, so that's when King died. Then you went into Vietnam, so you had the experience of black Americans with, with that situation abroad and here and how you were treated in, um, in the military. How do you compare or how, uh, how do you compare, uh, I would say, the events of the past four months to your experiences back when it was technically the actual civil rights era? You know, um, just before I graduated from high school, um, you know, I went to uh, uh, all black school, 100% black, Robert Smalls. In Beaufort, we had two black schools, Robert Smalls and St. Helena. So in 1968, they decided to integrate the schools. So they gave students the option of staying at your school or transferring to what we call one of the white schools. Mm -hmm. So. Um, I think there were about uh, maybe 100, 150 students from our school transferred to Buford High. And uh, I think there were two white students that decided to come to Robert Smalls. So <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> how many students went to the, uh, the white schools? About 150. And how many students came to Robert Smalls? Two. Oh my gracious. So, I know that was not easy for them. No, it, it wasn't. And, you know, in, in hindsight, I kind of feel, I feel really bad for those guys because they lasted probably uh, one day. They didn't last. Oh, they didn't even make it through the school year. No, they lasted about a day um, because, um, you know, uh, kids were just harassing them, you know, beating them up and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So uh, they lasted a day and then went back to their school. Mm -hmm. But... Um, you know, growing up in South Carolina during that time, um, it, it, although it was segregated, you know, I grew up during an era when I was a little boy, um, they had, uh, you know, black and white water fountains, you know, mm -hmm. blacks, you know, you had the inner uh, store through the back. You know, we had one theater in Beaufort mm -hmm. where the white folks sat at the bottom and the black folks sat up in the balcony. and. Um, and the white folks went into the front door, the black folks had to go to a side door around the side. So everything was pretty much segregated in Beaufort. But the, the one good thing about it though was that uh, you knew where everyone stood, you know. Um, you know who the... There were no closet racists. Yeah, there was no closet racism. You know who the good white folks were, you know who the bad white folks were, you know. So, um, um, yeah, that so was I pure segregation. Okay. So how do you, how would you compare your experience or how do you see the protests that happened? They were, I mean, they were pretty, they were pretty volatile. They were pretty um, expansive globally for good. I don't know, it lasted a few weeks. Cause I remember we had a conversation and I said, we'll see how long this lasts mm -hmm. and we'll see what happens after. Yeah. So do you think that there was any kind of impact and do you see any comparisons to the protests from the 60s? I, I sort of got mixed feelings about this because um, although I think that uh, protests are good, uh, especially, uh, you know, peaceful protests, you know, unfortunately, um, there was a lot of violence during the protests. And um, uh, sometimes you have, uh, you know, uh, people agitated to come into protests to sort of create the violence so that uh, uh, the, the, the protests can be uh, uh, deemed as a violent movement. Mm -hmm. You know, unfortunately uh, for George Floyd, uh, you know, being murdered on live TV. But you know, the, the, the thing that gets me though is that uh, uh, a lot of our uh, a lot of our young black youth they give um, <clears throat> they give the, the general population you know a bad rap, a bad name. Because um, sometimes, you know, you find a, a, a lot of the petty crime, stealing, carjacking, stuff like that. You know, granted, you know, a lot of black kids do that. Mm -hmm. and, it, and it puts everybody in a bad situation. You know, but um, uh, you have my brother, Anthony, has been a police officer for uh, almost 30 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that he is the model of what you would call a good policeman. Right, I uh, agree. He's, uh, he's a, a 
great policeman, great man, great father, great brother, and friend. Fair, you know, knows <clears throat> the community. Knows his community. Passionate, human, humane. And exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. But you know, um, I'm not against the police because I, I think that um, without it, we would, without policemen, we'd be in a real bad fix. But you know, just like everything, you have one or two, a handful of cops who are the rotten apples in the air, and it gives the policemen a bad rap. Just like you got a few black people who commit a lot of crimes, okay. they give a lot of black people, the most black people, a bad rap. Who do you think suffers the most from the bad rap, the police or black people? I think black, black people in general. I think black people in general. Although if you look at it statistically, mm -hmm. most of the violent crime in America is committed by white folks. Absolutely. But it never gets um, uh, it never gets discussed. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it's always highlighted when a black folk, when a black person does something bad. Mm -hmm. But you know, uh, oftentimes, like if you see the news, if somebody, you know, if there was a shooting someplace, uh, the news broadcaster would say, you know, there there was a shooting by a black man on this street or that street. But uh, oftentimes, if someone white commits the same crime, mm -hmm. they would just give. Uh, they would just say that a shooting occurred, mm -hmm. but wouldn't indicate the race. <laughs> right. You know. Right. So, um, so, so I think that um, you know, black crime sometimes is highlighted in the media, mm -hmm. and um, white crime sometimes is downplayed. But if you look at all the statistics, all the statistics, FBI statistics, local police, most of the major crimes are created by white people. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, but it doesn't get highlighted. Mm -hmm. So, where where do you think like what do you think is going to be the next step? Like, what do you think is going to be the next engaging movement or action? Meaning, you had you had the precipitation of okay, a re, a re again engagement with um, social social activism. You had more people standing up and speaking up and protesting. Mm -hmm. And now it seems to have died down. What do you think happens next? And now that we're moving, you know, now that we're during election time, do you think that that, that there is a direct correlation between who, what, you know, who, who wins the election versus what actual literal change could happen in the country? Do you see that as something that's coming out of the election or just as a natural, I don't know, evolution of the year? What we have going on today is a combination of a lot of things that have been going on for the past 10 years. And um, of which um, the biggest thing that's happened within the past 10 years that has led us to this point is Obama being elected president. You know, um, uh, uh, there were a, a lot of white people who supported Obama. Mm -hmm. uh, I have what I can really say, um, I do have what I consider to be really good white friends, mm -hmm. you know, uh, so it's not that, you know, all white people are bad because it's, that's not the case because I have some really, really good white friends, mm -hmm. you know, but um, when Obama was elected president, uh, you know, that good old white boy network mm -hmm. kicked in. Mm -hmm. That was a major, major slap in the face to that good old white boy network. So a as a result of that, um, I think that that good old white boy network uh, started feeling very insecure, that uh, they were losing uh, control over being the dominant race or the controlling race in America. Mm -hmm. It yeah. really frightened them. And controlling the propaganda of our society. Exactly. So as a result of that, um, that's why we are where we are today, where you have um, you know, a president who is, um, uh, his only legacy is to reverse and undo everything that Obama did because Obama was a great president. Uh, uh, you know, our president today doesn't really have an agenda. His only job is to undo all the good things that Obama has done mm -hmm. and uh, to create division. Uh, and just kind of wing it. Exactly. And to bring to light the call of action that, you know, hey, good old boys, good old white boys, we're losing control. 
We need to take back control mm. of our country. Mm. So I think that that's where we are. Okay. You know, that good old white boy network. So then if, if Joe Biden gets elected, you believe what will change? I'm not sure if anything's going to change immediately. Okay. But I think that um, if Joe Biden gets elected, uh, we'll, we'll have a president who's, who's respected because our president now is really not respected around the world, not even here at home. Sure. I think that um, we'll have an opportunity to, uh, uh, to, to reunite the country again. Uh, I, I think the only thing that, um, uh, that probably scares the good old white boy network uh, even more than Obama be becoming president is that if anything happens to Joe Biden, that we'll have a black woman as president of the United <laughs> States. And I think that that will definitely send them over the edge as opposed to having a black woman, the first woman and then the woman being black as president of the United States. Mm -hmm. I don't think the good old white boy network could take that. Yeah. Yeah, that would be a difficult one. They'll probably uh, put all the good doctors in. If anything happened to Joe Biden, they'll be right there in the emergency room. <laughs> exactly. Clear! <laughs> Clear! We can't let this man die. Okay. Exactly. All right. Well, I, I, I thank you for um, sharing your insight and your opinion and your feedback. And um, do you have any final words or any words of wisdom that you would like to share with, um, I don't know, you've been here for a while. You've been blessed to make it many years. We're not going to yep. say how many. <laughs> but you've been around for a long time, old man. Yep. I've been here so, for a long time. So if you want to close out with any uh, words of wisdom. We are definitely in difficult times. We're in difficult political times. You know, the country is divided. You know, we have a president who, who, who preaches division every day. You know, on top of that, we have a global pandemic. You know, uh, the thing that scares me and worries me that that um, you know the, the the life that I had growing up, you know, you know, doing different things, having an opportunity to travel, uh, having an opportunity to, to to really, you know, just venture out and do a lot of things that my grandkids won't have that opportunity. You know, um, right now it's uh, uh, it's it's a it's a difficult path ahead. You know, with the global pandemic being uh, in our midst right now, and if we can't get over that hump, you know, I think that our next generation is going to have it really, really bad on top of all the political upheaval. Yes. You know, uh, I hope that their future uh, is going to be brighter mm -hmm. than what the outlook is right now. Mm -hmm. But the uh, number one thing is that everybody should stay safe, mm -hmm. you know, do what the scientists say, Wash your hands, mm -hmm. social distance, mm -hmm. wear a mask, mm -hmm. and then pray. <laughs> <laughs> when it's all said and done, pray. if all else fails. Pray. All right, well, thank you, Mr. Vaughn, a.k.a. Daddy. And uh, thank you for joining us for another episode of Conversations with Leslie. Like, subscribe, tell a friend to tell a friend. See you next time. <laughs>